Hi, I'm here with Oliver Banks, author of the brand new book, Driving Retail Transformation, How to Navigate Disruption and Change. Oliver is founder of the consultancy OB & Co, which has kick-started transformation projects with global retailers, delivering over $100 million of net new annual profits for clients. Oliver is also host of the popular podcast, The Retail Transformation Show, and is one of LinkedIn's top voices for retail. Hi, Oliver. Can you show us your book cover? Hey, Pat. Well, it's right here, actually. Um, so there, there, there we go in uh, full glorious Technicolor. <laughs> it's beautiful. I can't wait to read it. Fantastic topic, first and foremost. Um, and just before we dive into it, I'd like to just step back a little moment because I'm sure we've all heard the phrase, data is the new oil. Uh, it needs processing and it offers some extreme value if you manage to dig it out of the ground effectively. But the thing is, data needs to create value in and by itself. Uh, and not like oil, uh, we often find ourselves in a place where we've got so much data uh, and actually only some of it is useful. So we need to really be careful about uh, how we process through that data. And in many ways, going back to that analogy, automation is like the oil refinery. It's how we can process through that raw crude data, if you will, and turn it into something valuable that can be turned into you know, many different products across the business. Data is coming in to this refinery, this automation from so many different sources around the organization, you know, whether it's from stores, from sort of various HR systems, from websites, so many, so many data sources. We could spend ages listing them all, right? And in all of those data sources, it's different formats, different types, different uh, databases, so many uh, variation, variations in that data. And really what we need to do is we need to be able to process that data through effectively and get it to the right output in the right format. So different teams can work with it in an appropriate way. It may need to trigger different activities or sub processes within the organization. Maybe we need to highlight issues for exception management, or perhaps it just feeds into management reporting uh, on, a, on a grander scale. And in the past, all of this has happened, perhaps not at a huge scale. And goodness gracious, it has been hugely laborious. I'm sure we've all spent time sitting on spreadsheets, copying and pasting from spreadsheet one, spreadsheet two, making sure you've got all the cells highlighted and everything. <laughs> and probably making lots of mistakes along the way. Uh, also interacting with lots of different databases, logins to various systems and so on. And really data automation can support all of this. It can make it so much simpler so that we're actually focused on creating value with the data, which I'm sure we'll come back to in a, in a little bit, rather than the processing of data. So automation is like taking that refinery and making it fully automated, you know, it reduces mistakes, accelerates the throughput time of the data, means it can be working 24 seven. And ultimately it's creating better data and more accessible data. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, again, we've come across AI hugely in the last year, but this has been a trend that's been building up for decades. But ultimately, AI is very dependent on what you feed it. Garbage in, garbage out. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, right? Um, so actually, the first piece is how do we stop putting garbage into a tool like AI or um, big machine learning, deep analytics, etc.? How do we clean the data? How do we find anomalies for investigation? How do we apply statistical analysis? analysis? How do we identify and exclude outliers? And ultimately, how do we direct all of the data into one sensible place so that we can start to build a single source of truth? Because as we have done for many years, when we have varying 
data sources, we have varying data. And so when you look at the data, you see one answer. And when I look at a different set of data about the same topic, I come up with a different answer. And this has caused, let's be honest, countless conversations and uh, conflicts and arguments across the years. So how do we build this single source of truth for something like an AI to really start processing? Because we don't want to get AI conflict going on. And we also then need to make sure that we've got multiple people and or systems accessing that single source of truth. So there's no point creating it and then not using it, right? Um, so really, I think for me, this all boils down to the fact that the purpose of data is not about having tons and tons of data, right? That is not valuable in and by itself. We need to turn that data into an insight, an insight that is interesting, that informs people, that educates people about something that they don't already know. But more important than that insight, what that data is really there for is it's there to change the future for the better. Because if the data does not change the future for the better, whether that's running through human analysis, AI, tools, et cetera, et cetera. If it doesn't change the future for the better, then frankly, all of the data, all of the processing and the automation, everything has been a, a, a waste of time and a huge distraction. So we've really got to make sure we can change the future for the better. All of the time, <laughs> all okay. of the time. Uh, we we need to integrate various platforms and that naturally creates silos. And I, I think we'll still be talking about silos in 10 years, 20, 30 years time, right? So I don't think they're going anywhere soon, although we should continue to look to knock them down. You know, we've got so many different types of data, first and foremost, that we need to integrate. You know, let's think about, customer experience yeah customer experience data first and foremost you've got qualitative data in customer feedback and comments and then you've got qualitative data let's say nps metrics or csat whatever that is so how do we connect those two very different types of data it's going to be different difficult to get a single source of truth so we'll have data silos and automation silos therefore that exist around that but we must also recognize in the very same breath, as we expand as retail businesses, as we think about uh, new opportunities such as retail media networks, we may need to start to intentionally create silos for automation and for data where perhaps we don't want to be sharing different pieces of information around. You know, we need to construct Chinese walls, we call it today, right? Mm. We need to construct Chinese walls within automation so that systems and particularly elements like AI are not using data that they should not be using, uh, which is crucially important as we start to engage more with privacy type conversations, both for a consumer, but as with retail media network uh, for businesses, business privacy as well. Well, that's a great question. Um, and actually, you're, you're absolutely spot on. Customers do shop around for prices. Prices are a hugely important topic uh, for customers. And it's such a tangible topic, right? I see this particular product here at $14.99 and this one at $15.99. Which one am I going to choose? Assuming it's the same. It's very comparable. So the first area where you can use a digital tool is actually in that price optimization. You can use it to really understand are you setting the most effective prices? Are you setting it at $15.99 and automatically pricing yourself out of the market? Or actually, are you setting it at $14.99 and perhaps leaving a little bit of cash money on the table? So where, where do you draw the line? How do you optimize that across the, you know, the varying choices that customers have open to them? And there are lots of fantastic AI solutions to help uh, both scrape the data, but also optimize the price given a huge number of different variables. Another factor that's also crucially important is stock management, right? Ultimately, if we don't have in stock, 
we can't sell it. It sounds obvious, but yeah, I think we need to continually reiterate that. And again, lots of great digital tools to help improve uh, stock flows from forecasting through to uh, remedying incorrect stock records. Yeah. But you're also right. We can also help a customer experience through CRM, through elements like personalization, which is a, a big buzzword. But realistically, we're still we've still got so much opportunity here. You know, I, I, I love slash hate the term email blasts, right, or broadcasts even. We need to move beyond that and into the world of personalization so that we're really tailoring a specific message to a specific customer based on their own preferences, their um, buying history, demographics, lots of different elements. And then, of course, we can't forget about helping make shopping more convenient for customers, whether that be through apps, whether that be through even mobile websites or, or lots of other value added services and digital tools directly for customers. Well, again, we touched on it earlier, such an important topic around stock management and stock integrity, and it's a, a continual head scratcher. We've always been thinking about stock and for, for, for me, we always will, certainly until we get into the world of totally digital products. But that's probably a, a conversation for another day. So we'll leave that one there. But let's just think about some of the different stages of uh, stock control, essentially. It all starts with forecasting and ordering. So how do we A, create these forecasts? How do we apply statistical variances? How do we apply patterns from what we know is going on in the world and the trends? And how do we then collate all of those forecasts to create an ultimate supply chain prediction of the future? We then need to be uh, making orders with suppliers, distribution centers upstream of the supply chain, and in turn, getting that back in. So there's needs to be a check processes in there. Obviously, there's a whole another conversation about what's going on process control wise upstream as well. Then we're into moving stock within our own control. And again, we're, we're working across different sites here, different distribution centers, stores, even within a store. And actually, how do we use a digital tool to work out what's moving when, make sure it's moving at the right time to the right place? It sounds really basic, but these are the challenges that many companies are still facing up against, making sure we've got that decent stock integrity and stock movement data. Yeah, as we move into monitoring, how do we support colleagues with stock control activities? You know, exception management is so crucially important. We need to move beyond counting everything all the time. So how can we direct uh, associates and, and colleagues towards uh, specific use cases to investigate further? And then it, that then informs the ordering loop. But we also can't forget all of the financial integrity that needs to sit alongside that. We've got you know, orders going out to suppliers, paperwork coming in. We've got obviously the physical stock coming in. We've got invoices coming in. How do we investigate and automate the, the matching of all of these different sources to work out, well, what did we want to happen? What has happened? Is that making sense? And when we throw in the timeliness of it as well, again, are we making adjustments and decisions based on the right data at the right time? So I think the the first big challenge is we're going to be, you know, the, the data is crucial, right? So we're going to be processing data on both sides, supplier and the retailer um, or, the, or the partner partner and retailer. And they're going to be working to different formats, different data types, all about the same information. Plus, all of the systems are working to different uh, speeds and timelines. And so the first piece is actually how do we match up the different pieces of data here. You know, a simple example is in customer name, right? Uh, one company may refer to you as Pat Brands. Another company may refer to you as Mr. Pat Brands. So actually, are you the same person or a different person? How do we, how do we manage to notice that? 
And I think, you know, this is where we can start to apply automation to begin to work through a number of these different uh, mismatches to say, actually, you know what, here's the rules that we're going to apply to make sure that we can connect this data effectively, continually as well, in particular areas where we've got this hugely time critical nature as well. Um, so I think, you know, that yes, there is a bare minimum of getting the data through to say, oh, okay, we've got this parcel flowing through or this order flowing through. But actually, how can we do that more effectively? How can we make sure that, yes, the parcel's flowing through, but the data is flowing through and backwards as well to power up things like notifications, like we were just talking about. Um, and uh, again, you know, many retailers want to do this, but it can be a struggle to connect all of these different data sources, particularly as you go out to uh, multiple careers all at once. And often what we see is an intermediary taking place so that it essentially acts as a, th a third party integrator of data. But with data automation, there's there's no reason not to start to think about how do we do this all in house? We know what it is we want to do. We know the customer notifications that we'd ideally send. We know the notifications to the operation that we'd ideally send, and we can make that all happen. Well, there's, there's loads of data pipelines, right? And um, if we break it into three broad, broad elements, each with multiple miniature pipelines in, if you like, mm -hmm. <laughs> So sales and finances is the first one, the flow of money. The second one is around stock. So the flow of physical product. And the third one is around customer. And I think there's probably a, a hidden fourth one, which we'll get to in just a moment, which is emerging. And so all of these data pipelines, like I say, they all have smaller pipes within them. And it's important to really understand, well, what is the plumbing? Where are they going from and to? What is the processing that needs to happen along the, along the route and how do we as we were talking about earlier as well how do we get to that single source of truth for all three of those pipelines so a single source of truth about the customer or about stock or about sales and finance again i've lost count of the number of times i've been in trading meetings where we've been talking about sales figures and we've got two different numbers for the same period which even here today in 2024 still happens although it seems semi bonkers to me that we're, <laughs> that we're still having those discussions now i mentioned a fourth pipeline that i think is an emerging pipeline which is all about the environmental and ethical uh, aspects that are coming in to really understand well how does everything flow through the supply chain and through all of the sourcing routes and i talk about everything in a really broad manner because that could be everything from uh, the material sources, you know, how much water was used in the production of the cotton that creates this garment or where were, you know, where were the animals raised and bred in this particular piece of beef mints, let's say, you know, uh, we need to think about how does all of that as data flow through to all of the different data sources, whether that be, you know, compliance reporting, whether that be for customer information as customers want to learn more and see more visibility around the, the, the operations of the business. Yeah, that's, and this is a great topic. My, my view is first and foremost, the CIO should be totally aligned and that the entire tech department should be totally aligned with the business right in terms of the main business performance reporting uh so this could be all all, all of the the classic measures right sales p l's customer experience measures but there are also likely to be some more leading measures as well not just the lagging ones so elements like availability or perhaps a delivery on time report so cios and the business should be focused on both of those elements together or all of those elements together. CIO should also be thinking, therefore, about how do we look further upstream? How do we think about the leading measures for all of those, even if they are leading? You know, what are the leading measures for availability, for example, that we can start to get a hang on to alert the business when something isn't quite right? 
you know, it, it needs to be thinking about making sure that systems, which are so crucial to the business operations, continue to flow through. And again, thinking more in that leading rather than lagging style as well. So thinking about you know, whether it's bandwidth, responsiveness, whether it's human intervention, something like that. And also elements like service tickets as well is a really crucial element because having service ticket reporting is a great way for the CII to help understand where, where does the business need the most help? Where do they need the most attention? And that might be from a technical solution point of view, but it might be from a, a human training point of view as well, for example. So it allows a sensible conversation and really it's important for CIOs to be proactive uh, within the organization, to be able to say, look, here's this opportunity. Here's something coming down the line. Here is something we can do better. You know, it's similar to what we're talking about data. How do we change the future for the better? And a CIO's role is to really help the whole organization understand how do we change things for the better? Yeah, absolutely. So trigger suits really important in a very simple way. A, a trigger is a simple if statement, right? So if if this happens, then that happens. In reality, we never work on such a simple use case, right? The triggers are multiple and intertwined and hugely complex. So the first element is to think about how do we really understand and map out what are the triggers we want to use? How do we want to use them? And often we think about the happy path, right? When the customer order perfectly goes through, all these things happen. And that's great. But often the happy path <laughs> is very easy to manage for. And it's how do we cater for that instance that something doesn't quite go right? And that could be many different things. You know, I've seen issues where triggers fall over because the customer address is too long, too many characters long to fit in. And suddenly a system somewhere along the line doesn't know what to do with it and the whole thing breaks. So how do we make sure that we're testing through all of the variables, all of the potential failure modes for these triggers whilst building in the complexity? And then I also think as we're, we're automating all of that, it's also important to think, as a system, how do we have an escape hatch? An escape hatch to say, I don't know why, quite what to do with this. Mm -hmm. I need some human assistance to step in because this is an instance that we don't know what, what it is. And that's great. It's much better to raise the signal and ask for help as a system, so to speak, <laughs> mm -hmm. than try and process with errors or do something unexpected. And then we can learn, right, well, where A, where is the system being challenged and where do we need to alter the automations or how can we perhaps think about new triggers or slightly different complex inputs to, to get the right output. Well, there's, there's, there's an awful lot here, right? Um, first and foremost, they should be really kept awake by the same challenges that the rest of the C-suite face, the business strategy and the business performance, which is, of course is very specific to each individual company. But the CIO, just like the rest of the C-suite, has got skin in the game in terms of making that overall machine work. You know, And they're, they're thinking about actually what are our overall goals, our overall objectives. They're thinking about how do I keep everything online? to make sure, particularly if we're just talking about legacy systems, you know, how do I make sure that nothing falls over? We've got SLAs in place across the company for internal customers, for external customers, and of course, for consumers that I want to continue to deliver. You know, I need to think about, you know, upgrading legacy systems. You know, we, we need to tackle the monoliths and we need to also think about new types of IT, you know, thinking about composable commerce, for example. And I think this, there, there, there's another couple of factors that must sit within the CIO as they're, they're lying awake in their pillow, pillow at night. And the first, first one is overwhelm, right? 
there are so many initiatives and changes going on in retail right now. And so many of them point towards an element of digital or IT or technology, right? Almost everything has something like that, which is, you know, drastically different. Even 10 years ago, right, the, where, you know, just digital is just so much more embedded nowadays. And the IT division, whether we call them IT or technology, bear with me, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, they have the hand in that. And in many instances, can be seen as a constraint within the organization because there is this bottleneck, this natural bottleneck, because everything feeds through IT. And I think for for CIOs, that overwhelm is is a big challenge and prioritization is is the answer to think about how do we make sure that we're getting the right challenges, the right opportunities resolved through our tech resource, but also how do we make sure that we're communicating clearly, which is the the, the other element I wanted to, to to raise in this. Because again, we've all heard those conversations where it's IT's fault or the IT team say they can't do this on time, blah, blah, blah. We've I'm sure we can all reflect on those conversations, right? But actually, how do we, with all of that overwhelm and the prioritization that's happening, how do we communicate effectively to ensure that it's it's an open conversation? It's an open conversation for the whole organization that ultimately feeds, as I say, towards that overall business strategy and performance. Well, I mean, we're obviously da data is a huge one and AI heavily connected to that, um, which we could all go in so many different directions. So I wanted to touch on a couple of alternative views here. So the first one is around customer convenience, you know, in particular, looking at in-store checkouts, hmm. uh, looking at different apps and uh, interactions that you can have with customers when it comes down to that payment point essentially you know there's there's always a lot of excitement thinking about self-service checkouts lots of trends around uh cashier free checkouts as well but also thinking about all the different payment options for online as well as in store as well actually how do we really understand the technology that is in play here think about what is best for the customer and how do we offer the customer choice because what is best for one customer is almost certainly not going to be best for all. So how do we blend that in? And we, again, we, we offer the customer the chance to choose and that, that will in turn give us huge amounts of qualitative and quantitative data to process through. The other element is around the new business models that exist within retail right now. Let's just think resale, subscription models, rental, retail media networks, retail as a service. These are all great business opportunities that deliver some solid profitability opportunities, but they all have their own requirements on the tech stack, mm. on the data and all of the data pipelines that flow through. And actually, how do we as a business reset ourselves to understand, well, here's where we are today. Here's our classic retail model, but we're also considering new models examples like I just gave, what does that mean for our technology and our data? And actually, how do we collectively as a business, how do we begin to process that through? Yeah. So um, you're obviously very knowledgeable in this area. And um, why don't you, uh, you, you released your book just last week, right? So that's tell right. Yes. About your book. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So it's called Driving Retail Transformation, How to Navigate Disruption and Change. And really, it's about recognizing that retailers are facing disruption on basically every single angle right now. And despite this need to change in the marketplace, it's very easy to say, let's transform. And it's much harder to actually transform. You know, we talk about the what but often the how is our biggest opportunity. And that's where the book comes in. It gives retailers the strategies and the techniques to lead the organization through the journey of change. 
um, you know, despite all of the uncertainty and the volatility in the marketplace. Uh, it's designed for retail leaders, and that doesn't necessarily mean I, I sit on the C-suite or I've got a, a big job title. This is actually a, an individual that wants to take responsibility to drive their organization forwards. And that could be at any level of the organization. You know, early on in the book, actually, I ask, do you want to be a passenger or the driver? So I suppose this book is for those that want to be the driver. Uh, they want to take the responsibility and it gives them the how to transform, you know, whether that's about how to understand the, the problem and the challenges that the business faces, how to define the appropriate solution going forward, how to manage your mindset and how to lead change or how to drive progress and ultimately execution into the company and the operating model. We, we could talk about flexible frameworks that exist to help avoid the, 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 the common challenges and the mistakes that are easy to make. And, and like I say, really, it's there to help navigate disruption in the market and drive change. Okay. Thank you very much, Oliver. And well, thank you. It's been a fantastic conversation. Yes, it has. And thank you all for joining us.